Good evening and welcome to our Facebook live section session, Meet the Expert with Dr. Alberto Papo. We are so thrilled to have Dr. Papo join us this evening for a Q&A about pediatric melanoma. For those of you who don't know, September is Pediatric Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And at the Melanoma Research Foundation, we're focused on educating about pediatric melanoma. So we're so thrilled that you are joining us tonight. We hope you will learn a lot about what pediatric melanoma is and be advocates wherever you live around the country. So part of why we're doing this session is leading up to our Pediatric Melanoma Summit, which is coming up later this month. And you'll hear more about that a little bit later in the session. Normally at our summit, we gather families and pediatric melanoma patients for two days of a really good fun time at Great Wolf Lodge. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we can't do that this year. So we've extended the learnings to the entire month of September. So we hope that you'll glean a lot of information during this month and then join us at our virtual summit later. So to kick it off, <laughs> we're going to have our first Q&A with Dr. Alberto Papo. But before we do that, I would like to thank our sponsors for generously supporting our Pediatric Melanoma Summit and the work of the MRF. I'd like to thank Alchemies, BMS, Merck, and Novartis for their generosity and support of our nationwide symposia program. And I would also like to thank all of the in-kind sponsors who've generously donated product for our families and our littlest patients to enjoy during the summit. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alberto Papo, the Alvin Maurer Endowed Chair at St. Jude. Dr. Papo is the Director of the Solid Tumor Division and the co-leader of Developmental Biology and the Solid Tumor Program. And today we're gonna to have an informal conversation with Dr. Papo about his work at St. Jude. So with that, I will let Dr. Papo say a couple of words about, about his work at St. Jude, and then we'll kick it off with some questions. Thank you very much, Kylie, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm honored to be here, and I hope that I'll be able to answer some of the questions that you may have with pediatric melanoma. Uh, as Kylie said, I'm a pediatric oncologist. I'm a pediatrician, and then I did my pediatric training in pediatric oncology at, uh, in Dallas, and then I came here to St. Jude um, that was my first job, and actually one of my first interests was uh, pediatric melanoma. Uh, my mentor here was Dr. Charles Pratt. He was the guru of pediatric rare cancers in the world, and he was my mentor as a junior faculty here. And one of his interests was melanoma, and actually I wrote my first protocol for the treatment of pediatric cancer at St. Jude focused on pediatric melanoma. Back then we knew very little about it and it was just a combination of a bunch of chemotherapy with interference sort of put together. And that's sort of where my interest in pediatric melanoma grew. I uh, stayed here at St. Jude for about 10 years and then I moved to Canada. I went to Toronto and I was at the hospital for sick children there for five years. And then I decided to come back to the States and I went to Baylor in Houston and I was the head of the solid tumor there at Texas Children's. And then I was recruited back to St. Jude in 2010. So I've been back here for about 10 years. And overall, I've been at St. Jude for about 20 years. Thank you, Dr. Papo. I always say it takes a very special type of person to treat children, let alone pediatric oncology. So thank you for all that you do on behalf of our littlest patients. Um, for those of you who don't know what pediatric melanoma is, many people hear about it and they think, well, I thought only adults could get melanoma. Um, could you maybe talk about what pediatric melanoma is and what treatment options are available and maybe how it differs a little bit between adults and kids? Yeah, so that's probably one of the most difficult questions because I think that the concept of pediatric melanoma has evolved over the past 20, 25 years. So back in the late 80s and um, early 90s, I think that we used to lump all of these lesions that we know that are different now as pediatric melanoma. So that included spitzoid melanoma, spitz melanomas, uh, what we used to call meltumps, which are melanocytic tumors of unknown metastatic potential. 
and actually conventional melanoma. So we used to lump them all together and we used to treat them because we didn't know any better, just like the adults did. So back then we used to do the biopsy. We used to do the big resection. We used to do the sentinel node biopsy. Then we did the lymph node dissection. And back then we used to use a lot of interferon. That was the therapy of choice after complete resection of uh, <coughs> metastatic melanoma to the lymph nodes. And then <coughs> when the occasional pediatric patient developed metastatic disease, we basically just used some of the therapies that were available in adults, which back then there wasn't very much. There was DTIC and IL-2, there was not a whole lot. Over the years, we know now that pediatric melanoma is a spectrum of a variety of different diseases that usually, in our opinion, at least based on Dr. Barami's work, who was the pediatric pathologist here for many years that just moved to uh, Emory, we think that there's three basically major subtypes of so-called pediatric melanoma. There's one that is the conventional melanoma. That's a melanoma that's basically indistinguishable from the one that you see in adults. And that usually occurs in adolescents and young adults. And when you do molecular analysis of that uh, specific tumor, it's almost indistinguishable from the one from adults. So they usually have what we call a UV signature. That means that there has been UV damage to the cells. They usually have BRAF mutations, like the ones that you see in adults. They usually have TERT mutations, which is something that you see in about 70 or 80% of adult melanomas and they tend to behave clinically just like the adults. That is, they tend to recur if they're very thick, if they have nodal disease, they tend to metastasize, and the metastases that you see are very similar to the pattern you see in adults. So that is the minority of the melanomas that we see in pediatrics, but those are the ones that we usually treat just like adults and use some of what we've learned from their surgical techniques to the sentinel node, to immune therapies, to targeted therapies to treat. There's another subset of melanoma that occurs in younger patients, and those are patients that are usually born with this very large nevi, usually in the back. They're called large congenital melanocytic nevi, and about three to five percent of these patients develop a melanoma within that. These melanomas also have a very distinct genomic alteration, different from conventional melanoma. They usually have a mutation in a gene called NRAS, and these melanomas tend to be relatively aggressive. They can metastasize or disseminate to the brain. And at least in my limited experience and an experience from other pediatric oncologists that I've talked to, they are usually refractory to treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors or with targeted therapy. So that's an area that we need to do a little bit more research because we really don't know very much about. And then the vast majority or the bulk of all the pediatric melanomas that we see are this melanomas called spitzoid melanomas or spitz melanomas. And these are the ones that we usually see in patients usually less than 12 years of age or less than 10 years of age. And these are the ones that are characterized by what we call fusions. That means there is a gene that is abnormal that goes and comes together with another gene and that's called a fusion. And usually the genes that we see are BRAF, NTRAC, ROS, ALK, and more recently, MAP3K81 gene that we described here. And the, main, the most important thing about this is that the behavior of this Spitz melanomas is very different from conventional melanomas. Even though this the Spitz melanomas tend to have a higher incidence of lymph node metastases, usually these uh, melanomas do not metastasize beyond the lymph nodes. And we believe that there are some genetic predictors of how a Spitz melanoma is going to behave, and that is a mutation in a gene called TERT. TERT is basically a gene that basically causes immortalization of the cells, and at least in our experience, the patients that have developed metastatic disease, that is disease beyond the lymph nodes, have had a TERT mutation, which is a minimal number, or less than 10% of all Spitz melanomas. So the way we approach Spitz melanomas now is very different. We usually do a biopsy. Some centers do not even do a sentinel node biopsy. We still do a sentinel node biopsy because if the sentinel node is positive, we can follow that very easily with ultrasound. But we do not do PETs, CAT scans, and we do not give what we call adjuvant therapies, like the ones that they use in adult, either with checkpoint inhibitors or with BRAF inhibitors, and much less with 
interference. So it's a concept that I think that has evolved over the past 10 or 15 years. And it's really now more of a combination of pathology and molecular diagnosis to really get to the right diagnosis of quote unquote pediatric melanoma. Thank you, Dr. Papo. And I would say to anyone watching, if you have questions for Dr. Papo, please, please write them in the comments and we'll try to address them during this Facebook Live session so we can get your questions answered as well. Um, so just feel free to type them in the comments section and then we will ask Dr. Papo live. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask Dr. Papo was, you know, pediatric melanoma is rare. About 500 children a year are diagnosed. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges? Because as an advocacy organization, we hear a lot about the hurdles in diagnosis, right? So kids having a spot, it's not diagnosed quickly. A pediatrician might never even see a pediatric melanoma in their career. Um, so again, it's, it's very rare, but what are some of the hurdles that you're seeing in the field, um, maybe in early detection or in treatment um, that you think need to be addressed? So that's an excellent question. So I think that the first thing is education and recognition that it can happen in the pediatric population. It's not gonna be the most common cancer or the most common tumor that you see, but at least be aware that it can happen in pediatrics, that there are certain groups of patients that are, are increased risk for developing melanoma. For example, those that have a giant nevus, or for example, patients that have been treated with chemotherapy and radiation, or patients that have other syndromes that may predispose them to develop this. Um, the other issue is, um, when in doubt, I strongly recommend that you ask your primary care physician or your pediatrician to refer you just to a dermatologist. They have significantly more experience. They can do dermoscopy and they can then determine whether a lesion needs to be biopsied or not. And then the third issue is if there's any question in the diagnosis of the lesion, try to seek an expert opinion from pathologists around the country. Because uh, again, it is, um, the implications for therapy are significant now that we have all of this ability to do genomics in these tumors to better define how this tumor is going to behave. In the past, again, it was easy. You take it out, you do a sentinel node, and you give interferon. We don't do that anymore. There might be a large proportion of pediatric patients in which you do not have to do surgical procedures or give therapies that are not warranted that can cause significant um, uh, side effects. So that is my advice. And also just uh, recognize that it can happen. And then I think there's another question later about prevention and this, we'll talk about that, but just recognize that it exists, that mm -hmm. it is very rare, like you say, but that it can happen. And if you as a parent or as a primary care provider have any questions, just refer them to, to the specialists. Absolutely. We're gonna take a question um, from a viewer. So. The question is, I had melanoma as a young woman, age 26. My children are teens now. How often should they get full body skin checks? Well, that's a good question. So I think that it mostly is going to depend on the type of skin that they have and as to whether they uh, have any moles or anything that are of concern. Uh, familial melanoma can happen. We have looked at the incidence of what we call germline mutations, that is mutations in your genes that predispose you to the development of melanoma. And at least in our preliminary analysis, we did not see a higher incidence of that in pediatric patients with melanoma. We also did not see a higher incidence of a family history of melanoma in patients that develop melanoma. There are a lot of cohorts that have been studied before in which there are specific mutations that do predispose you to the development of melanoma. One is called CDKN2A. Well, that's a specific subgroup of patients that have a very strong family history, multiple carriers in the, in the family, and those need to be tested. And in those, you would start more preventive measures. In this specific case, uh, I think that uh, if there are no significant risk factors other than the family history, such as, you know, skin that easily tans or you know blue eyes or multiple moles or red hair i think that just the regular uh, appointments with your pediatrician is more than enough i don't think that they need to see 
uh, dermatologist more often than you know you would normally see one. Great. I have a question, you know, as a parent myself, what I notice with my daughter is, you know, children's skin is constantly evolving, right? So they're getting moles and things are sort of popping up as they get older. Whereas adults were always told if you have an existing spot and it's changing, that should be an alert for you, right? So the A, B, C, D, E's. But for children, their skin's constantly changing. What as a parent should we really be looking out for? You know, you mentioned you know, the condition where children are, are necessarily are born with it. So that would be something that's that's apparent, um, the large nevi. Um, and you mentioned, again, the, the melanoma that's more similar to adults. And then you, know, you mentioned spitzoid. Can you talk a little bit about what a spitzoid melanoma looks like? Um, and again, for parents who are looking at their child going, I don't remember seeing that spot on their wrist a month or two ago. Um, so they, so they're a little bit more aware. You know, so the ABCDE sometimes are not applicable to pediatrics, right? Sometimes you don't see the asymmetry, the evolution, the change in color. Spitz melanomas can look ma in many, many different ways. Some of them look just like a little pyogenic granuloma, which is just like a round little bubble. A lot of the uh, of the uh, uh, Spitz melanomas that we've seen, they look like that. It's like a red cherry little color thing on top of the skin. I think that one of the things that the parents should look uh, at is a lesion that is evolving. You know, that's one thing that I always uh, look at. Is the lesion changing in any way, whether there's new little spots in the lesion, whether the lesion is growing, whether the lesion has changed color, whether the lesion is itchy, whether the lesion is bleeding. Those are the things that I've seen, at least in my practice, that have prompted the parents to go to their pediatrician and eventually be referred to a dermatologist. Wonderful. Yeah, I think as parents, you know, we're always sort of staring at our children going, is this normal? Is that normal? And I think, um, you know, clearly to look at something and if, if it is, like, like you said, raised, bothering them, irritated, um, you know, to make sure that you go in and see your pediatrician and, and see a dermatologist. Um, let's talk prevention now. Can you give some tips on prevention? Well, the usual, the usual stuff, right? I mean, so be like a lot of people say, be sun aware, right? So, uh, and that may not directly impact the development of melanoma early in life, but it can significantly impact the development of melanoma in the future. So definitely sun awareness, use, you know, um, uh, uh, avoid, uh, sun tanning beds. Actually, there was a very nice study that was uh, done a few years ago looking at the incidence of melanoma in the first 40 years of life. And actually, I was actually kind of surprised that there was a dramatic decrease in the incidence of melanoma in the 15 to 19 year old group. It was about a 4% decrease per year in adults and about a 5% decrease in the incidence in uh, in girls, and that was thought perhaps to decrease use of sun tanning and more regulation on the use of on self, of sun tanning beds. Also, to use you know long sleeves and a hat, especially during the peak times between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Some of the clothes that they have nowadays also have an SPF protectant, and of course use you know lotion to prevent at least an SPF of 30. Be very generous with it. Even if it says that it's waterproof, it's really not waterproof. So they can last just for a couple of hours. So I would strongly recommend that you reapply during those times. So those are the things that, that I would recommend. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Papo. And I wanna talk a little bit about our pediatric summit, which is coming up here virtually in a couple of weeks. You have been involved in the past. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with the summit and why it's important for families to be engaged and, and, and join in if they're a patient or newly diagnosed? Because the uh, pediatric melanoma community actually is relatively small, right? That, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, pediatric cancers that I see and treat that are a little bit more prevalent. And to give you an example, for example, the pediatric neuroblastoma community is huge, right? And they also work as an advocacy group 
So I think that what struck me last year about the Pediatric Melanoma Summit was, you know, how the small number of families that were there were all together, were all interested, were advocates for this, and they're really going to be the voice of the future, bring these drugs to our children, raise awareness. So I think it's very important that this, I, I think this summit is very, very important, not only in increasing the awareness and the education of pediatric melanoma, but bringing families together to be actually the advocates for this disease. So that's what really struck me at the meeting last year. I think it was fantastic. Thank you. And we're so excited to reconvene our, our families, hopefully at the Great Wolf Lodge in Arizona in 2021. I think, um, you know, again, what these families can learn and then take back to their own communities across the country in terms of awareness and education is also so critical. Um, so again, we're, we're really thrilled to be able to host the summit virtually, but I do think having those families together to have the support system to learn from each other and to certainly learn from all the wonderful experts like yourself who are there to offer advice, to offer you know, information about what's coming down the pike in terms of treatment options is so critical and brings so much hope to these families because I think when you have a rare cancer, there's so much uncertainty um, and there's so much anxiety around that, that information is power and the more that we can provide that to this community, the better. So we're, we're definitely grateful to you and to all of the clinician scientists who join us at the summit and, and definitely are looking forward to not only the information we're gonna share this year virtually, but certainly next year. Um, I just have one last question for you, Dr. Papo. And, and that's really kind of an open, an open question of, you know, is there anything else that you wanna mention that might benefit the larger community about this rare form of melanoma that you think is important that we didn't we didn't necessarily cover, you know, um, in this session that you want to mention? So, I mean, I think that one of the things that has always bothered me, and that was the talk that I gave last year at the summit, right, is the lack of um, drugs for pediatric patients with melanoma. And I gave a couple of examples last year, and I'm going to repeat them again this year because it still bothers me. I was involved in the development of the pediatric study for the first BRAF inhibitor that was called Vemurafenib. I don't know if you remember, this was like in 2009 or 2010, was like a breakthrough drug at ASCO. And it took several years after demonstrating that it's very efficacious in adults and it was FDA approved to develop a pediatric clinical trial. And by then it didn't matter because the drug was already approved and people that saw a handful of pediatric melanoma patients with a BRAF mutation were already using it. So the problem with this was number one, that drug was not made available early enough for the pediatric melanoma patient that could have benefited from that. Second, patients were not participating in the clinical study because the drug is already approved. So while I'm gonna put them in a clinical study, if I can just prescribe an SVD approved. Third of all, I'm never gonna learn the true profile of toxicity in pediatrics because these patients are not in a clinical trial so the physician that is treating this patient is not, not gonna report this, right? So that is very bothersome. Second example was ipilimumab, the same story. It was already approved when the phase quote unquote two study in pediatrics opened, which I was the senior author of that paper. It only accrued eight patients. And the reason for that is it was already approved in adults. We already knew that it worked. So why are you gonna put a patient on the ipilimumab study if you already know that it's approved and you see responses in 15, 20% of the patients. And that drug was not made available early enough for potential patients that could have benefited from that. Same thing is with a PD-1 inhibitor story, right? There has been a tezolizumab, this has been prembrolizumab, more recently nivolumab and ipilimumab, but this drug's already approved in adults, so it's a little bit too late. So I think that, uh, advocacy through your organization, through the parents, and with the RACE Act, raising awareness that there are certain subtypes of melanoma that are very similar to adults that have the same genomic component. And this patient should be allowed to participate in trials that are exploring new therapies. Let's say when they're 12 years of age and older, given that opportunity, not wait five, seven, or 10 years, until that drug is approved and we know that it works and create a completely different new clinical trial for pediatrics. That to me doesn't make any sense. So I think that's one of the main 
things that continue to to bother me but again with the race act which is something that i'm uh, you're going to uh, hear in one of the virtual talks that i'm giving uh, i'm hopeful that that will change absolutely research is so key and certainly access and for the for the patients and their families who are battling this every day to know that they they could participate in something brings so much hope you know and that's that's the key is to really advance the research and advance the science and bring more treatments to these young patients so thank you for being such a wonderful advocate for access and for pediatric melanoma research we appreciate all that you do um, and Again, if people have questions, please feel free to write them in the comments section. We're gonna be wrapping up in just a minute, but again, we will do our best to answer those as well um, once the presentation is finished. So with that, Dr. Papo, I just would like to thank you again. You're doing a wonderful presentation for us during our summit. The Pediatric Melanoma Summit is September 21st through 25th. You can register and join us. Um, you can participate in some of the virtual sessions. We have great activities for kids. Um, we have great activities for adolescent young adults, wonderful information for parents. And again, the MRF is here as a resource for patients and their families. So thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Papo. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the comments section and the MRF team will address those later. So. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you at the summit in a couple of weeks. Thank you.